Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome to Finding Me in the ITV Networks. In a continuation of the interview that I had last week with uh, Kwezi Mabasa, Kwezi is a part-time lecturer at the University of Pretoria in the Department of Political Sciences. He is also a project and research manager at FES South Africa and is a very strong activist. But more than that, he's a brilliant academic mind. So with that, thank you very much for being here again, Kwezi. Yes, yes it's, great. it's great to engage here. Um, Kwezi, we ended the last discussion um, around what you said was internal contestation sometimes within social movements and political parties in terms of the kind of sabotage that you will see or perhaps and also legitimacy how yeah. people view the, the ruling political party. Yes. Would you then say just to take that discussion a little yeah. further <clears throat> with the rights in Shwane with the change in terms of the mayoral candidate for the ANC there was a strong contestation around legitimacy there as well? I'm not sure whether it's ar around the legitimacy of the ANC in China. I think it's about the legitimacy of the ANC general, generally in the country. Mm -hmm. I also think that the, 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 the shifts in the electoral behavior are informed by things outside of local politics. So for example, the ANC has had a lot of internal contestations, um, I mean, over party issues, over issues around candidates, right, mm -hmm. that have not went down well with people in various localities. But also, too, the ANC has always also historically relied on a strong labor movement to organize and mobilize in elections. And as we know right now, there is a, um, like there is a, 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 a change within Kosato where it's going through some serious difficulty, difficulties. So I think that was also a crucial So factor. the splintering in Kosato yeah, is also yeah. causing a splintering yes, in the ANC. In the ANC. Yeah. And I also think the third thing also is that, uh, I mean, uh, so people do have increase access to basic goods, but the quality of those goods uh, is questionable. It's questionable, right? And I think that's also coming up. Um, so I think it's those issues. I, I don't think it's necessarily about the personalities per se, but I think it's those systemic party issues that, that, that are happening in South Africa. Um, I, I know that everybody is arguing that it's also because of, of the rise of the middle class and it's urban voters that vote for the, that voted for the DA, and that signals a positive thing for, for democracy. I'm not really convinced from a, from a class perspective because when I look at the South African middle class, they mainly use private goods and private resources. So they're more a class that's concerned about their individual interests rather than the public, and, and, and the public good and public development. But the second thing also is that when you look at the South African middle class, it doesn't really, hasn't really contributed to political dif development and discourse as other middle classes around the world. So, um, so are you saying that the political discourse and the development yeah. of the discourse has come more from the grassroots yeah, yeah, the working class? Yeah, it comes from the grassroots rules. Our, our middle class is mainly concerned about private interest and its assimilation towards uh, internationalist middle class status, which is its economics. So I'm, I'm not convinced that it's just that. I think it's more those structural factors around the ANC that lost, that lost to a decline. And I think it's also uh, because of that, of those structural factors that I mentioned, is, is you also then had the rise of EFF, which is eroding ANC's traditional working, black working class yes, co yes. constituency base. And, but then, and that's, yeah, yeah I, but I, then, yeah. but then, does the EFF have the potential to capture the middle class as well? No, it, it's going to be difficult because the current articulation of black consciousness in, 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 in within the EFF is is very narrow at times, <laughs> and uh, and not necessarily uh, very inclusive. And I think that's a challenge that they also trying to address. I also think too it's going to be difficult because of the class orientation of the South African middle class. As I'm saying, in my view, the class orientation of the, middle, of the South African middle class is uh, they they basically concern not necessarily about the public good and the development of of, of 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 politics in general and public spaces. They're more concerned about preserving individual interest and they and they access to those and that privilege. Yeah, but then somebody who's listening to you will say that, but I mean, most of these individuals who are now part of the middle class. Mm actually started off as black individuals who were in the lower class, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. Who suffered and endured these hardships, yeah. who know what South Africans suffer and endure. Mm -hmm. How is it that in this propelling movement, in the shift from the bottom to the middle, that at that point you begin to forget what the rest of South Africans are feeling? I don't think you begin to forget. I think your class position 
and your immediate economic interest start to supersede broader universal notions of, of equality. You see. So are you and, then losing so, your racial identity in that process as well? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm losing and the, I'm showing you how the two actually intersect. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. So if you, took it, you look at the, the definition of the rise of the black middle class in South Africa, it's right. about increased access to private goods, right? Yes. Which were mainly goods that only white people had. access, yes. yes. And it's also about increased access to not only the goods, but also the geographic spaces yeah. where, those, where those goods are in close proximity. So you move into Houghton yeah. and, 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 into Houghton Santon, and Santon. Yes. Waterloo. Exactly. And exactly. So that's where the, the, the class and the race dynamic then start to intersect, right? And I don't think that's embedded uh, or that coincides or it's... It's, it's, um, it complements some of the, the policy positions uh, and the politi political articulations of the, of, 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 of the EFF. Um, and I think it also counters this, I think in my view, very bourgeois argument that for us to develop a democracy, we need the strong middle class that can hold people accountability, uh, accountable. And, you know, because you must also think about it. The middle class, I mean, let's look at one of the contentious issues that has been raised by the middle class. They raise issues around racism within private institutions such as Kiro. But my argument has always been, but is that necessarily an issue of the general black collective? Is that a collective education issue? Yeah, and exactly, I'm not convinced. Exactly, yes. Because in my view, the middle class was using its, its, its skills to articulate different, uh, um, to develop the public, uh, public institutions. Mm -hmm. Then it would be, be, for example, focusing more on the fact that uh, schools in working class areas don't have the libraries. Uh, schools and working class areas don't have the computer labs, well, don't have the social infrastructure. Yes. Yeah, don't even have proper classrooms. Don't even have proper classrooms, you see. But you can see that the narrow preoccupation of this middle class is basically to assimilate. Yes. And then also get economic goods that are associated with the white middle class lifestyle, not necessarily to rapture <laughs> the narrative. That's what I think. So. Yeah, about the, about the old debate around the middle so, class. So that's a huge challenge in terms of yeah. how the landscape in South Africa is changing also. Yeah. Because then when you become comfortable in that particular exactly. space, mm. you s start, well, you fail to articulate then the voices of your historic yeah. past. Yeah, you don't. And in fact, the, because you become comfortable in those, as, as I mentioned, geograph uh, privileged geographic localities, you have access to those private institutions to solve public pro pro problems. Um, your politics then becomes different. It's a politics of preservation, not about restructuring, reordering. And even when it is about restructuring, it's reduced to narrow identity. So I want to be the only black, the only black neurosurgeon. Not necessarily, why aren't our schools teaching, producing, producing more, science yeah. and biology that can produce uh, more, black. more black neurosurgeons. And, and even why don't our schools and, and some of the historically black universities have the facilities mm -hmm. to allow for the development of a cohort, a co collective cohort of new black. So, you, it, it, so it's it, about preserving that particular yeah, niche for yourself. Yeah, for now. myself, yeah. In, in, into assimilation towards whiteness. I'm not, that's why I, a lot of people are euphoric about this idea of the, of the, of the middle class voting, the DA, and that resembles a shift in politics. And I just see it as a deepening of privatization, in my view, and a deepening of a very narrow, self-interested political identity. Uh, uh, and that's basically it. Um, and, and I think, yeah, I think that's a major concern for, for, for all left formations. Yeah. Yes, it is. And talking about left formations, I know you had a very interesting debate on the discussion of left formations and how to identify yes, them. Yeah. And does the left have a voice anymore? Is the left just more a little bit of the right, right a little bit yes, more of yeah. the left? <laughs> what, what, yeah. what is your, your contention about yeah. this whole issue, this notion of the left? Uh, the left. The interesting thing is that I think neoliberalism has has changed the way we conceive of left and right. I mean, let's think about Benny Sanders. People are calling Benny Sanders left. In my view, he's not necessarily left. I mean, at best, he's like maybe a right version or a conservative social democrat. Mm -hmm. But because neoliberalism has, you know, um, sort of like confined alternatives <laughs> so much that um, anybody who just speaks about a glimpse of equality is, 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 is configured as left. So I think that's the first point. So it, what, the point I'm trying to answer is like left is always taken in relation to the context. But I do think that left formations are going through a transformation globally. So if you look um, at debates around the national, min at, at things around, around min minimum wages in country, around the right to food, it's not being articulated by traditional left organizations only, like labor unions and communist party. You have NGOs that organize in various, uh, on ver based on various issues involved, church groups, uh, community-based organizations, uh, who are also involved in these traditionally left debates. So I think there is a transformation right. uh, yeah, in left politics. I also think the second thing is that there's also a rejection of a Eurocentric 
left, right, which is that our activism is confined to the canons of like Lenin and Marx mm -hmm. and Eurocentric Europe yeah, and, and Eurocentric versions of transforming capitalism. I think there's a recognition now that we need that there are different ways of articulating a egalitarian economic system that are not necessarily confined to what we find in the Communist Manifesto. And it's interesting because if you look at the Latin America, for example, there you have activists who are using traditional principles of economic organizations uh, and then inserting them into their activism about challenging capitalism and not necessarily the canons that, 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 that we all subscribe to. And I think the third thing, and maybe this brings into the debate about race and class, there's also a recognition that capitalism doesn't develop, hasn't developed the same in, in all communities. And therefore, we have to take the specific uh, historical uh, story and backgrounds around the development of capitalism so we can also capture the development of capitalism that coincided with other authoritarian forms of social relations like racism and so forth. So mm -hmm. in other words, capitalism coincides with other um, uh, relations of subjugation. And I think... It also keeps, sustains yeah, them, isn't it? Yeah, it sustains them. And I think this is why for me, I, 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 I don't believe in this whole primacy debate around is it, is it a race or is it class or mm. is it gender? I think at different historical conjunctures, uh, the two intersect in a particular way. So if you read, for example, the readings of the Caribbean Marxists, which I read a lot of, uh, Walter Rodney, um, C.L.R. James, um, Stuart Hall, and it's very clear from their readings that they don't even think, take the, 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 the debate on primacy as, as an essential thing. They're more interested in how the two intersect at certain epochs in history. And, and for me, I think that is a more f fruitful sort of way of understanding race and class and, and, and how to develop and how to use it as an analytical tool even for the contemporary era. Okay, so now yeah. I want you to hold your thought there, but when we come back, we're going to take this discussion of the intersection between race and class into what's happening in basically in the US, okay. in the UK, and then I want you to bring it back, back. home. Okay. okay, so we'll see you after the break. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to the second segment of the second interview today on Finding Me on the ITV Networks with my very special guest and that's Kwesi Mabasa. And before we went into the break, Kwesi brought in this whole notion of the intersectionality between race class in terms of defining the particular space and the context in which you are that then regulates what you find is happening in society. And I think Kwesi, that's a, a very important question because we see a change in the formulation, if I may say, mm. of the way in which societies are being represented in the current political debates, mm. um, especially in the US, mm. and with the kind of attention that Trump has got and the support that he has got, and with the uh, British public voting in terms of Brexit. Yeah. I mean, both have been a kind of shock to the consciousness for many people. But in my mind, I thought it's articulating what people have always felt, but maybe just were not brazen enough to articulate. Now, I recently read an article where um, this one in the, the author states that what we see is an emergence of class politics, both in the US and in Britain, because in voting for Brexit, it's the middle class this time who are getting politically, politically engaged. It's not only the labor unions, but it's the middle class who have started to lose jobs or feeling the pinch in terms of their housing, mortgages, etc. Of course, with all the bailouts to the banks starting from the 2008 financial crisis, the middle class has now felt the pinch. And so, you know, we have succumbed to this rhetoric of fear, uh, kick out the migrants and the immigrants, yes. mm. the blacks, the Muslims, everybody is the other. Mm. So that maybe coincides with what you said about race and class. Mm. And then in the US, you have the same because Trump's rhetoric yes. is more or less yeah. the same. How do you see this? And then how do you pin that entire issue in terms of South Africa? Because I feel when the students and, and the, the the, the groupings within South Africa start to, to rebel and raise their politics, then it's always pinned in terms of class. Yeah. I mean, sorry, in, in terms of race, race yeah. yes. I think that, I think we must just agree, I mean, it's, it's quite obvious now. The system, I mean, even the people who support this dominant neoliberal capitalist system are even questioning it themselves. So well, the, it has failed. Yeah, Let, let's be failed, honest yeah. about but it. So there's, there's no a crisis way. of capitalism. Yeah. So the crisis of capitalism, of global capitalism, will permeate all societies. Whether you're South African, you're from the UK, you're from the USA, it will do it. But the articulation, and this goes on to what I said about race and class at specific historical conjunctures, the articulation of the crisis in the various societies will depend 
on number one, the nature of class relations society and how those then intersect with other relations of domination historically in that society. Because people's response to this, this current crisis is also based on their social economic position, right? And where they are, their social capital and what, and what has happened. And that has yeah, been informed yeah. by the historical By the development. historical, the, yes, right. yes. And, and I think in America you have different strands. So you have this, you know, this Black Lives Matter strand, which started off actually within this human rights, very liberal black rights discourse. But now it's actually starting to articulate issues around black people's uh, lack of access to economic opportunities. Uh, the fact that uh, most of the black areas have underdeveloped uh, social infrastructure. Um, the fact that um, there's still racism that exists within the workplace. So it's, it's, you can see again that again- The momentum is shifting. Yeah, the, yeah there's, a moment shi there's, there's a shift there within that particular struggle. So I, and that's related again to the intersecting relationship between the two, right? Uh, that the development of capitalism in America has always, you know, favored the yeah, whites. Favored the whites, but based on also on, on racial subjugation. And just the interesting thing about America is that the initial form of slavery in, in America was called indentured labor. Okay, indentured labor it was actually it was multiracial in character. It's only after the revolution in 1648, vacant rebellion, whereby it, it took a serious racial character. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, so, and then I think with the Trump issue, I've spoken about the Black Lives Matter, the Trump issue. When I look at Trump supporters, it looks like you have sort of um, a sort of a, a lower white middle class uh, and a lower, and not a lower, but a, a, a segment of the of the white working class, right? That mainly support Trump, right? And their main frustrations with the American dream, right, are mainly you can see economic, uh, right? Uh, but they use racial prejudice to advance those. Or to articulate. Yeah, to articulate. That. But yeah. Maybe because that's yeah. all they know. Yeah, that's all they know. Yeah, right. they mean eco economic. So, I mean, and it's interesting because also, um, I mean, what Trump is not say is, is saying is basically inciting particularism in a group, <laughs> uh, and 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 then using that to say that this is the state of why a national economy, economy is yes. in the particular state. So it's not a national economy that's developed around capitalism and it's failing, <laughs> but it's a it's a so national. you're playing the uh, playing the blame game. You don't yeah. want to look at pointed inwards, uh, but you find somebody yeah, else. Yeah, something to, else. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's yeah. essentially what's happening in in America. And it's I don't think it's not it's not all white people. It's clear it's the, there's divisions among different uh, uh, segments of the white population in America. But his supporters I've seen is a, a, a segment of the working of the working class and the lower middle class people who have felt the negative effects of globalization. So whom you and would relate yeah. to as in terms of the poor whites in South Africa, yes, which for I'd, example, those yeah, kind, that kind of category, who Africa. would still vote FF, Freedom exactly. Front, and, exactly. and, and Solidarity and those yeah. kind of things. Hundred percent, yeah. And and always during times of, of economic crises, all polit most political leaders, especially authoritarian political leaders, focus on narrow political particularism or nationalism to advance their interest because it's easier to do that than to address the systemic cause. But it's also easier because Trump is also part of the same economic elite that's producing the developmental crisis in America, right. you see. Yeah. And in order to deflect attention from that, he has to then focus on the particularisms. Yes. Yeah, yeah, with something else. Um, and the interesting thing also about the US is that there's actually essentially no necessarily an inherent difference between, in my view, from an economic perspective, from what from um, the Democrats and the and the Republicans, yeah. So when people talk about Bernie Sanders rupturing the the political and social order, I'm I'm not convinced. I'm not. It's yeah. a big question. Yeah. Mm, mm. Okay. And in yeah. terms of Brexit, what do you see? The same kind of a story? Well, I think there were it's a mixture because Brexit there you're dealing with different nationalities. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's. But a, it's it's strange that they yeah. chose to leave. Yeah. The white identity, which is yeah. Europe. Yeah, but I, but I also think there are a number of things we have to put into context here. The first one is that within Europe itself, there's also class differences within Europe, mm. right? Um, and when there's a crisis, as, as I mentioned before, people always go for more particularism. Yes, so I the understand. idea that we need to protect our own resources. Yes, and that's exactly what's happening. Xenophobia as well, yeah. that, that happens, right? So I think it's part of that, of that particular, of the development of the particularisms and yes, politics. So let's focus yeah. on Britain now. We don't yes, have to worry about the rest exactly. of them. But I think also, secondly, people have underplayed how a lot of groups have been, have had uh, criticisms of the EU for a long time. So I was watching something the other day about the, the Scottish fishers, who, uh, who historically have always been opposed to the EU, right? Because the standard, the, the, this uh, uniform standardization, uh, the trade policies have had a negative effect on their particular fishing But countries. they want to stay in the EU. Yeah. Um, 
No, no, I'm talking about the fishes. Oh, the fishes. Not okay. the government, yeah, but okay. the fishermen in there. So it's interesting how when people talk about Brexit, they don't look at the class politics around Brexit. Mm -hmm. So who was opposed to Brexit and who was supporting it? Yeah. So I think, yeah, that particularism, there's a strong class, class dimension to it. Um, and, and, and the third thing is that people are also asking deeper questions around regionalism and the fact that you had regionalism, but was it democratic? So did it allow ordinary Europeans and citizens to participate in decision making? And some of the, the criticisms of the, of the project was that it was regional, but it, it wasn't based on participatory decision making, it was too centralized. So there's a number of factors, I think, that are behind it. But, uh, but would you say that the primary factor that needs to be renegotiated or perhaps restructured now is the, is the, uh, the economic system yeah. and re-envisioning of how you're going to let capitalism yes. function? Yeah, that's, that's the one. But also, too, it's difficult to have a regional political economic system where you only have centralized monetary poli uh, policy, but you don't have fiscal policy to support that. Uh, so it's quite, it's problematic. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. because we're, we're, we're almost at the yeah. end, yeah. and I want to really bring this back home, yeah. and yeah. coming back to this whole identity politics, yeah. um, where you spoke about specific groups and group interests, yeah. my question then to, and you, because you said clearly that in the US and in Britain, it's not all whites that, yeah, you know, yeah. who are doing the same yeah. in South Africa mm. also. Mm. We have this understanding that it's all, not all whites who are racist, or not all whites who are supporting yes. racist policies and race life. There are whites who are now really beginning to stand up and take accountability to question this notion of privilege was supporting very white students participated in the fallers movements yes, as well yes. there are black african students who, who voted for and fought against africans was fall because they felt that it uh, all africans are not african speaking people are not the same, same. and that freedom front does not speak for the liberal black Afri uh, for the liberal african speaking yeah. individual mm. what is the outcome or, or the what shall I say, the, the end game, the final game for whites in South Africa uh, in terms of your identity politics based on what we see in this very narrow nationalistic yeah. identity in terms of black politics. Mm. And if you consider that South Africans, white South Africans have a role to play that they contribute, um, you know, is there a place for them? Yeah, no, I think there is a place if, they lit if they're willing, number one, to acknowledge and let go of their social economic privilege. Um, then there's definitely case because then they believe in a non-exploitative uh, society that is non, not characterized by the racialized capitalism that we have. So there is a place for, for white people who want to do that. But secondly, I think it also there is a place if the, the nature of activism and, polit and political discourse that goes forward in South Africa relates all identity questions to the class question, right? Um, because I, I think it's important because then we understand what justifies or what has justified sometimes exploitative identity. Okay, but relating it to class, but yeah. not to the exclusion of race, right? Not to the exclusion of race. Right, okay. And that's what I'm saying. For me, it's not a, a debate about primacy. It's about understanding how at certain points in history, the race and class configuration of society has supported the development of capitalism. It's that simple. And I think, the, the, as I'm saying, the Caribbean Marxists who wrote about slavery and the Atlantic slave trade have done that. Uh, other Marxists who have wrote about the peculiar uh, uh, the, the race question in the, in the, in the, in the, colo in the colonies uh, or the former colonies, Fanon, Amika Karpal, they've all done that, mm -hmm. right? So you, know, you don't neglect the other one. It's, you understand but it's about re-envisioning it in terms of the context in which yes, you are. Yes, and the conjuncture in which the one plays into the other. Like, for example, right now in South Africa, um, there's, there's, because of the change or of the minimal change that we've had in, let's say, the capitalist yes. structure, the integration of some yes. black elites into the economic capitalist structure, it means there's a way in which we analyze capitalism that is different from the way that we did maybe in the 50s and the 30s, right. you see. Um, so I, I think that's, that's the way that we can fi find a place. But I think what's important, and this is where I do agree, though, with the black consciousness movement, is that um, white, white liberals and people who are in positions of social economic privilege must admit that. And the second thing, they must be willing then to develop collective and democratic forms of economic and social production, right? So it's time to share. Yeah, and it's time to share. Yes. And not always question when it is time to share. So I think that's, where, that, that, that's what I think should happen. So we're at the end. Yeah. I want your parting comment mm. to the youth of South yeah. Africa. I think the youth of South Africa, the first one is that um, we have to read uh, not only in school, outside school, about our history uh, and, ha and how South African political, social and economic systems have developed so that we can have a very clear and informed uh, sort of vision around how to change the country. The second thing I also want to say is that um, 
we have to conceive of, of our, or we have to th rethink how we view education and skills as just something not that, that, that doesn't assist you to get material goods and live a flashy or certain life, but as a way of developing and reordering society. Uh, and I think that's very important. And three, we have to understand that every generation has always had its own peculiar struggle. Uh, the 1960s student movement was very influential in challenging imperialism uh, and, cultural, and cultural imperialism and racism as well. Uh, and they stood up and they, and, they, and they articulated their form of activism in various ways. We have to develop those international solidarity links, both in the, in the continent and outside. Um, uh, there are issues, universal issues of justice, of equality, of democratic economic governance that go beyond just South African uh, peculiar identity. And we need to get in, in touch with those. Yeah. So the whole idea is get in touch with your consciousness and get educated. Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for being here, Chris, and for sharing these wonderful ideas with me. And thank you. We'll see you again in another episode. Fi Manila. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Hadi tantadimu da'at bil